안녕하세요. 미주중앙일보 원영석입니다. 오늘은 캘리포니아 재무장관 존 챙을 모셔봤습니다. 존챙 장관은 2018년 6월 캘리포니아 주지사 예비선거에 출마하십니다. 어, 챙 장관과 함께 일자리, 무역, 불법 체류, 그리고 도널드 트럼프 대통령 당선인의 정책 등에 관해서 어, 얘기를 나눠보도록 하겠습니다. Hi, John. Thanks for stopping by Korea Daily and doing this interview. Uh, Kate, would you like to introduce yourself very shortly to our Korean readers and viewers? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm John Chung. I'm the California State Treasurer. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Treasurer's position, I'm the state's banker. So I handle the uh, short-term investments. I invest your money, uh, $70 to $75 billion a day. I'm responsible for 15 economic development authorities. So in your communities, as you build affordable housing, as you create jobs, Uh, as you try to build uh, and increase and enhance your infrastructure, I help finance those projects. So think about your banker, whether it's the commercial banker, whether it's the retail banker, whether it's the investment banker. I handle those transactions for uh, cities, counties, and the state of California. Okay. So President-elect Donald Trump, he will be sworn in on the 20th. And, you know, many people are worried. Some people are ex Excited, you know, it's it, he causes a lot of emotions throughout a lot of people. I would, I would say, and the mainstream media has also been very critical about the upcoming Trump administration, and especially, I would say, many undocumented are very, very scared. Uh, what would you do as governor as California in California? Well, the president-elect has made some very bold yeah. pronouncements about immigration. We have to think about the history of America. This country was founded with the Native Americans and with immigrants, and so. Regardless of whether you came from Europe, whether you came from Africa, and today many come from Latin America and Asia, we're a country that harbors and enhances the dreams of many. So that's my principal focus. How do we build a California that, the, that aspires to the very best of its people? Now, in regards to what you said about undocumented, we have to make sure that we put in place a process where those who come to this country uh, get a pathway to citizenship. There's an extraordinary need. California is heavily based on the contributions of immigrants, both uh, legal and undocumented. You think about our farms, who's harvesting those products. You think about who's building the houses, the roadways, and others. So let's make, do this correctly, and hopefully we'll get uh, President Trump to reevaluate, to, excuse me, President-elect Trump, mm -hmm. to reevaluate some of his policies and to understand what has made America great. Mm -hmm. So what, concern, what concerns you most when you uh, listen to, you know, you've been listening to a lot of uh, what President-elect Trump has been saying throughout his campaign, and it's, you know, it was printed all over, you know, and the media covered it a lot. What concerns you most about his positions? Was it, is it a trade deal or his immigra immigration stance? I wanted to know your opinion. Well, I, I, I was hoping he would try to speak in a language that empowers people. Uh, I think a lot of people feel disconnected, disenfranchised. But on the other hand, the, the people voted for him and he won in the Electoral yes. College. So the, uh, I, I respect that process. But America is stronger when we are together, when we believe in each other. As we come forward and we celebrate Martin Luther King, right, it was that aspirational la language that we look into the hearts and souls and eyes of people and the, we put aside the things that are artificial barriers to mm -hmm. us. So America is best when we celebrate its people. And so I hope he will be a leader of all our people uh, and not understanding that you can help some but leave many behind. We understand there's extraordinary economic struggles uh, that face many. Here in California, we have the fastest growing economy. We, are, we have rebounded from the world's 12th largest economy where we were during the midst of the recession today to the world's sixth largest economy. You're absolutely correct with close to a $2.46 trillion state domestic product. Mm -hmm. But how do we make that success? How do we increase that abundance for all Californians? Because there are still too many left behind. Yeah. And uh, President Trump said if he had campaigned in California, he, he would have won. This is his opportunity to campaign in California, more importantly, by saying, I'm going to do good things for Californians. I'm going to help you get housing. I'm going to create more jobs. I'm going to make sure that we bring people of differences together. Mm -hmm. What do you think about his position on trade deals? Uh, like he said he would slap 30% to 40% tariffs on you know, goods that are produced outside of America, especially American products, I would say. Like, for instance, he wants all, you know, many of the Apple products, like iPhones, manufactured here in the States. Um, would, wouldn't that bring the price high? So and it gives consumers more tough, makes the consumers having a tougher time to 
buy those products? Well, I share a similar perspective with uh, Pre President-elect Trump. I want more products and services developed here in the U.S., but you can't do that with a trade war, right? So I, I will support the President-elect when he identifies bad practices that are taking place elsewhere. But, you know, we want to encourage trade, competitive trade. America has to be very competitive. And if others are doing it correctly, then we ought to engage in trade. Mm -hmm. And yes, you are correct, right? The, if you have, uh, you create tariffs, if you create across the board boundaries uh, and walls, uh, uh, right, in this regards to trade, you will increase the prices f for, f on many products. Oh. But you do believe there should be some kind of um, protection? The, uh, I believe protection is proper when you have others that are engaged in improper practices. Okay, uh, I understand. So that, that would mean that probably we might have to put more tariffs on foreign products, like for instance, like Samsung in this case. Well, the, uh, you don't, you, what I'm opposed to is you don't do a blanket, right? I mean, if people are engaged in the, what we already know in, in existence today, dumping or other types of products, but the, you, know, you don't see individual companies doing it across the board, right? We have to go product by product and making sure that everybody, including the United States, is doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. What is your position on illegal immigration? The, uh, well, I believe that we need to m create a, a pathway and mm -hmm. the federal government has to lead to make sure that we can bring those who you know, operate in the dark uh, into the forefront. Mm -hmm. You have transparency, accountability, and give them a, a proper way to make sure that they become American citizens. Mm -hmm. right? Then you have to think about the other obligations. We want to make sure that they pay their taxes. Some of them are paying their taxes. Uh, and that we have a proper place. Mm -hmm. What do you think about process. what do you think about the wall the that President elect Trump has been saying that he wants a border southern border and put a wall there. Yeah, well, that he wants Mexico to pay for it. What is your thought on that? Yeah, uh, we we know that's a non-starter. Uh Mexico is not going to pay for the wall. The uh, you know, the I, I don't know what that wall what purpose that wall serves other than to divide people, right? Mexico is California's largest trading partner. Canada is also a large trading partner. The, I know he's concerned about immigration, right? If you want to create a, the proper process, then work on uh, making sure that we have legals, uh, a legal process. We have federal laws that he assumes the leadership, which he certainly can, and I want to encourage him to do so, to create a process to have uh, legal immigration. But isn't he also saying the wall because he wants to stop the drug trafficking? You know, like you have uh, heroin problems in, in like New Hampshire and all these states. Is it that also the reason why he's talking about the wall? Because to, in that case, I think it does kind of make sense to you know block those illegal uh, drug activities. Yeah, that I don't know if the wall is the most efficient way to do that, but obviously it has larger consequences than just uh, the uh, you know the uh, trade in narcotics. Okay. And you know, Kate Steinle, you know, you know, he, she was shot, uh, I think it was almost one and a half year ago, uh, by an illegal, illegal immigrant in front of her father. Uh, the guy was, who shot her was deported out of the country five times. He came back the sixth time and then shot her down. And that tragedy happened. Uh, what is your thought on this? So some people say, you know, Kate's law, you, you heard about Kate's law, that it should be approved um, in Congress. And uh, I wanted to know your opinion about it. Yeah, first of all, my heart goes out to the family. The, uh, you know, I lost my sister uh, yes. to, to violence through being abducted. So I am very sensitive on this issue, right? So this is the proper balance, right? We, we want to make sure that we, the, you have immigration policies that recognize the nuanced nature. Uh, I don't want local government involved principally in making sure that they, we enforce the immigration laws. Mm -hmm. But we do have to stop crime. You know, that those types of activities where you put innocent victims, uh, in, in this case, the loss of a, a beautiful young lady, uh, we have to make sure that our policies reflect the protection of people properly. Mm -hmm. So how can we do it when he comes back like six times? You know, is it, it, I mean, isn't there supposed to be some kind of protection for the people to feel safe? You have these rule, your laws about sanctuary cities. You know, it, it, it has become another issue. And especially with President-elect Trump, you know, bringing this on the forefront, and he said he would defund uh, cities that um, does this act, you know, sanctuary cities. Uh, what, what is your position on sanctuary cities? Are you for it or against it? Yeah, I, I believe that local governments ought not to be enforcing the, uh, or their principal job ought not to be mm -hmm. uh, in, enforcing federal immigration policy. However, right, they do have an important public safety responsibility. And so it's important that we bring both local government and the federal government uh, to work together to come up with the best policies in regards to notification and other things. We want to stop crime, but we also want the, uh, 
we want to make sure that we have the adequate co cooperation and communication between our law enforcement okay. agencies. So you're saying if we over-enforce, it might hurt the people who kind of abide by the law here for the, the undocumented? The, it, w I want to make sure that they're not principally involved in immigration, but they do have a criminal justice function to make sure that those who are engaged in things beyond the immigration function itself mm -hmm. are, are held to the standards of the law. Okay, got it. So what do you think are the biggest issues uh, California is facing right now? The, the big issue today is uh, watching what's happening with the disparity in opportunity yeah. equality, uh, opportunity differences in our communities. So as we referenced earlier, California has had an extraordinary uh, rebound in our economy. Uh, people generally are doing very well, but we still have a large pop segment of our population that live in poverty, that don't have access to housing, that are, aren't getting the best education that they need. So I, want to, I have worked for 18 years squarely in trying to create upward mobility for mm -hmm. all Californians. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Uh, the high-speed rail, um, do you like the idea? Are you for it or against it? So I like high-speed rail, uh, the, but the issue is also not only how do we have mass transportation, how do we close the gap, how do you recognize the population growth, uh, it's how do we finance it. So okay. I would work very vigorously to make sure that uh, we have conversations with private sector parties to finance it because I want to make sure that that obligation is not all held by the taxpayers of California. Mm -hmm. Got it. And how about the Delta Tunnel project? Are you also uh, pro or con? So I support the Delta Reform Act, which was passed in 2009. So it puts in uh, place a process. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we protect uh, the delta. We want to make sure it, the uh, ecosystems, the biosystems are sound, that they are uh, they're environmentally protected, but we also have to recognize economic growth. So it's a dual process where they check both tracks, mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to follow that process. All right, okay. And California has been suffering from severe drought, uh, is it like the fifth year now, I, I would say? Um, is it getting any better? We had some rain last year in Northern California where they uh, have, where it's more important, right? We have our water reservoir up there, and um, and this year we get a lot of we're getting a lot of rain down in the south. Are we getting better in the drought situation? Right so now? we're getting slightly better, uh, but we have to be very smart about it. Even though we've had good rainfall, mm -hmm. we don't have the same amount of snowpack, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at our uh, deli water delivery systems, uh, a lot of it was built where. You would think for every decade out of three years, you would have uh, a, lot of, a lot of good snow, right? And basically the snow and the mountains that held it would be our reservoir system. Yeah. And then we have the additional surface uh, storage systems, right? And as it melts, you would control it through uh, the infrastructure that we have in place. And then it would convey down to Southern California, which is huge chunks of it are desert. Mm -hmm. So while we've had rainfall, we don't have that same amount of snowpack. Mm -hmm. And so part of our concern is what do we have over the long term for the state of California. So yes, with some of the rains, we made some short-term progress, but we haven't resolved for the long term the water concerns for, for our state, especially here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how is California do, doing in the education front right now? So we've made progress, we're continuing to make progress, but we have a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of those areas where you have disparity in uh, various yes. school yeah. districts. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that we have uh, create opportunities in all communities. Uh, every child ought to have access to a world-class education. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I want to push for is greater school site leadership. Uh, as we discussed a little bit, our parents were very involved in our yeah. education. Yeah. If you want school systems Too to work, much. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about yeah. the, some maybe a little bit the over-involved, uh, but it's important to have great school board members, great principals, uh, great teachers, great school employees, and parental involvement working together uh, mm -hmm. so that those local schools and those communities are very involved in a child's education. Mm -hmm. I think I listened to you once in a previous interview somewhere, um, and you talked about this. Harvard did a study about you know, one poor student, you know, and if you put him in a good environment, he did pretty much as well as um, other students here. Can you kind of talk about sure, that? Sure, yeah, there, there, there's a the Harvard study where if you take a child from a low income community and they put them in a higher income community and they're work, uh, with being educated by others uh, in that same environment, the academic difference, uh, achievement, uh, delta drops dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, the wealthier kid will always have greater access, but once you get a good, strong foundation, they'll perform very well. And that's why I was articulating a little bit early why we have to build great opportunities in all communities, great mm -hmm. schools, great teachers, 
uh, great school leadership uh, in every community. So because not everybody can be in San Marino, not everybody can be in Beverly Hills, not every child right. can be in Rolling Hills Estates. So but let's make some of those uh, middle income and lower income communities schools uh, where people are involved. You don't need all the money, but if you're involved, you'll change that child's uh, trajectory in life. So zip codes kind of matter where, you know, right? Yeah, oh, that, yeah, that's profound, right? That's very important. So it's not only education, but healthcare outcomes and other uh, impacts are impacted by which zip code you live in. Yes. And um, like you said, California is the sixth largest economy in the world, and, but disparity has been a big problem, especially like in Southern California. I think even in San Francisco, Northern California, we have this huge homeless issue that's, that has struck here. Um, what do you think is the cause of the sudden increase of a lot of uh, homeless issues? Is it because of the CRA disappearing? Or what, what is your thought on that? Well, part of it is, uh, and the, the numbers have been terrible, right? You're watching a lot of single moms with their kids yeah. you know, out on the streets. Uh, downtown uh, Los Angeles is working hard on it, but it has the largest chronic homeless population in the United States of America. Uh, New York, being a larger city, has the largest homeless population. Uh, so part, part of this is you need the resolve from the community, and, but especially from the elected officials, to say we need to build smart housing in their communities, and they have to make housing a priority. When I got to the treasurer's office a couple of years ago, I made housing one of my top three priorities. So under the former treasurer, in his last year in office, the treasurer's office helped finance 14,000 units of affordable housing. Uh, the need each year grows by about 60,000. I rewrote the rules last year, and so this uh, in 2016 uh, that just just finished, we uh, financed 25,000 units. And so when you think about Los Angeles having 26,000 chronic homeless population, it's like you know how do we start taking down those areas, the homelessness? Yeah. Uh, so I'm excited, but it's going to take a lot of work and focus. Um, how long would you think it would take to kind of you know uh, diminish a lot of you know homeless and you know? How long would, would, would you think? This, this is just, I, I know that this would be a chronic problem, but right now it's just too much. You know, if you could just go outside our company, you can see a lot of homeless around right. there. And it hasn't been that, that way, like uh, I would say three, four years ago. Uh, how long would you think it would take to kind of really decrease it to at least half? It's, uh, it, it depends on what, how much uh, people are willing to do immediately. Right, so not only is it the financing of those projects, right, if the state made a huge investment, uh, we can make good dents in the next uh, three to five years, right, because you have to figure it, in local areas, you have to do the zoning, you have to do the permitting, you have to do the development, uh, so that's not a quick process. Mm -hmm. But if you go full board and people made a very concerted and powerful effort to try to affect change in regards to housing, uh, we could get something meaningfully done in the next yeah. three to five years. Yeah, okay. And infrastructure, uh, what is the current status of it? Um, your thoughts? On it? So California is uh, vastly un underfunded yeah. in infrastructure. If you mm -hmm. look at the American Society of Civil Engineers report, we are $900 billion mm -hmm. underinvested. So last year I actually put out in my treasurer's report how to think about infrastructure financing. Mm -hmm. So part of it is at the state level, we don't have a central inventory of all the state's assets. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? You have to go to various departments. It's incredibly inefficient. So what I would do is try to create that central inventory. You know, wh what's the status of our housing? What's the status of our roadways? What's the status of our bridges? What's the status of our schools, mm -hmm. uh, school buildings? And then bring all those assets together and bring all the interested parties. Then uh, identify what's the useful life. You know, what's the highest priority? How good a condition? Do they need maintenance? Do they need repair? Do they need replacement? And then you have the discussions with the underwriters, the bond people, the personnel people, as to how to best finance those types of projects. Mm -hmm. So that's the approach that I'm advocating to address how we finance uh, and tackle the infrastructure concerns of California. Okay. I know you're a big numbers guy. What is the current uh, outstanding debt of California and how can we pay it off? So you're talking about bond indebtedness bond. or you're talking about all the issues? Bond. So, we're, yeah. uh, so for the state of Cal just the state, right? Yeah. You're not talking yeah. about local. The, uh, state, the, yeah. this, the state is uh, a little bit north of uh, $80 billion. Okay, $80 billion. And what is your position on climate change? It seems like this is also a president, uh, you know, a national issue. President-elect Trump is very skeptical about it. And some are even arguing that even though it might be real, the biggest violators like China and India are not cooperating enough to do anything to turn the tide regarding climate change. So, and that, that it also affects jobs negatively. 
and I wanted to know your thoughts on yeah, so I, climate change. I trust the scientists, right? The climate the scientist says climate change is real. Is that ninety eight percent of the, all the scientists? Yeah, most right? of them say it's uh, it's real, right? Yeah. The uh, and so right, people talk about climate change. They it gets more technical, right? The I'll listen to MIT professors say it's climate. It's like global uh, disruption, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so obviously we need something. We need something to do with it. We had we had the Paris. We had the COP twenty one yeah. where you had one hundred ninety six countries uh, sign on to right. So I think we're going to see international progress made on that field. Uh, we have to understand that. America, because we're the big industrial engine, have been, we're the largest polluters. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have made changes, others have made changes. Uh, it's gonna be challenging for them, as it had been for us, because we have to recognize that countries, when, when you're talking about China and India, which have signed on, they're trying to also grow their economies, trying to create political stability. So mm -hmm. it's like, how do we create the best services, the best products, the best practices? Uh, and we have to learn from them also. Okay. In metropolitan areas, uh, affordable housing has been a big issue. Uh, what can be done for, for that? Yeah, part of that's what you referenced earlier yeah. in regards to redevelopment agencies. Mm -hmm. when, yeah, we had CR, that financial, yeah. when we had that financial crisis, uh, we know that the governor led the effort to eliminate the redevelopment agencies. Actually, he just wanted to amend them, right, because mm -hmm. you had some abuses uh, with the redevelopment agencies. They took, some of the cities took it to court. They lost, and so they eliminated right. it. I would bring back some of the redevelopment agencies in very limited, would you? yeah, oh. in some of the limited form, but, but not in full form. No, the because we had abuses, uh, yeah, right. right? We like, had we had four like a golf course thing, right? Uh, yeah, my independent review. It yeah. didn't rise to the level of an audit. When you when you're using hard earned taxpayer dollars to finance a four and a half star golf resort, that's not a good use of taxpayer dollars, right? The city of Coronado is beautiful, but the whole uh -huh. city, right, which is you know multi million dollar properties. That shouldn't be a redevelopment agency, right, right. right? But where you have true blight, where you have contaminated property, yes, let's support the cities, try to redevelop th those areas, maybe a business incubator or use it for affordable housing, use it for some other facility for greater uh, mm -hmm. public purpose. If you have to put a number on it, like how much of the percentage do you think were wasted of uh, the, all uh, this yard? Oh, I don't want to hazard a guess. <laughs> yeah, the, the, right, the, uh, the, so, some were, did, some did very well. Mm -hmm. uh, Right, we did when I did my independent review. Uh, so we looked at 18 agencies. Uh, a few of them did it correctly, and others had various degrees mm -hmm. of uh, compliance issues. Because mm -hmm. Koreatown was also hit hard after the CRA disappeared. You know, we we were supposed to have some these kind of mini parks, but those deals were all canceled, and it's still not done. So many of the Korean American activists, they they were they wanted me to ask you about. CRA a lot. A lot of their questions were regarding this. And if you, if you said, because 20% of those were required to use for uh, low income, right? So it's, CRA, uh, right? yes. So you're referencing the t what's called the 20% set aside uh -huh. for low and affordable yes. mod uh, moderate housing. Uh -huh. Yes. So that, that was basically local government's contribution to help finance affordable housing. And so when that was uh, eliminated through, because of the elimination of the redevelopment agencies, that help create the financial pressures uh, on affordable housing. Because when you put together affordable housing, you'll have a federal component, mm -hmm. you'll have a state component, and you'll have a local government component. And when you had that last recession and the federal government wasn't in a strong position, the state of California was in deep financial crisis. Mm -hmm. right? I was working to keep California from a financial collapse mm -hmm. when I was a controller. And then when you had local government losing their CRA, right, mm -hmm. and that 20% set aside, mm -hmm you had the loss of those right. main sources of right. dollars for right. affordable housing. Uh -huh. You're right. And uh, this field, I think you announced, and the big three names is, are John Chang, you, uh, and uh, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, and former LA Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Um, I wanted to know, do you have personal rapport with both of them, right? Uh, so <clears throat> I know Antonio and I go way back yeah. when, and uh, Gavin and I sat together on the State Lands Commission, but mm -hmm. I don't know him as well. Okay, so um, I wanted to know your uh, opinion about them uh, politically, or uh, um, just your opinion. So bright yeah. and very bright and talented uh, <laughs> public officials. So uh, is, is that all you you gotta say? Oh yeah, about the, them? I, I, right, okay. I, I, I like I like them. I I, I enjoy the uh, I, I appreciate their work. Okay, no negatives so far. I, you don't want to talk about. I, them. I'm not. That okay, type. Right. I'm not that type all of right, person. Okay. So you were born in New York, right? Yes. And grew up in Chicago. Suburban. And now Chicago. you're living here in LA. So you 
lived in all the big three cities, right? So, uh, did that experience help you as a person and politician? You know, the, in other cities? Yeah. So I was born in New York, uh, so, but I didn't spend much time there. So it's like yeah. zero to three, oh, okay. so I don't oh, remember right. much. My, uh, my upbringing in Chicago or a suburb of Chicago was uh, very uh, the powerful in its impact. Mm -hmm. We were the first Asian family in the community and we were discriminated against. Mm -hmm. And so that helps govern uh, and form who I am and how I lead. Uh, I know how it is to be treated as a second class citizen, how people don't respect you or don't care for you and how you just have to fight mm -hmm. to be given an opportunity. And so a lot of my mentality and support is for the underdogs, right? The people who have to struggle harder. Uh, I think mm -hmm. government uh, needs to understand that people want better lives and you know, how do we build laws that support each other. Okay. And um, I didn't expect to, for you to mention it, but when, when we were talking about Kate, Kate Steinle, you also talked about your sister. Um, how did it affect you personally and as a politician, I want to ask you that. Yeah, well, my sister and I were very, very close. So yeah. the, as we were growing up, there were four kids, uh, and we were named, it was J.R.J.R., JR, so John, Robert, Joyce, and Roger. Mm -hmm. I was eight years older than Joyce, uh, and so my mom wanted all four kids to be close. Mm -hmm. And so if my brother Bob and I were going out, we would have to bring my little brother and sister, right? And sometimes we thought, oh, right, you know, this makes it difficult. We want to go play softball, and how do you watch your little brother and sister while you're playing softball? at the same time, but it made us very close. And then my sister shared a lot of the same passions and yeah. interests. Uh, she went to law school, right? She went, she went to the same law school. She worked on Capitol Hill. Yeah. She was actually an immigration attorney uh, right. when she was abducted. Uh, so uh, yeah. yeah, when she passed away, it's, you know, it's losing the person that you would have, I would have the closest communications with. So when I would go through difficult campaigns, right, I would call my sister and she's three hours ahead, but you know, I would call her at, Two o'clock my time, it'd be five o'clock, and she would just listen. Like the, mm -hmm. uh, I think she understood who I, right. who I was. Because I thought that the situation was kind of odd. She went, went to a Starbucks, right? Yes. And then all of a sudden, it was just four blocks from her house, right? Yeah, and a few blocks. It's, it's, it's just you know, unbelievable what yeah. happened. And uh, um, my condolences. Yeah, anyway, I appreciate Nicole, that. Thank you. And any last words you want to say to our readers and our viewers on our camera? So it's been an honor uh, to be with you. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I, I just wanted to reach out and just share the, share the incredible work uh, that uh, all of you have done. And I just want to wish everybody a happy 2017 and just to implore upon all of you the importance of being your very best uh, in this world where today many people are struggling, uh, their trajectories can change dramatically. And then uh, take responsibility for the people in, in your life. Uh, I have a uh, a couple of sayings that are impactful for me. So uh, I'm Catholic. Uh, so uh, St. Francis of Assisi w once said, the, uh, uh, all the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of a single candle. Uh, so be that hope and be that inspiration uh, that changes people's life. And then along the same lines, there's a quote for an organization that I contribute to on an annual basis. It says, to the world you may be one person, but to one person you may be the world. So I have, that's why I live my life inspired and I live my life with great hope, even though a lot of people are very fearful or concerned today, because yeah. if you believe in each other, if you believe in uh, yourself, uh, you believe that there's a better future ahead for all of us. Okay, and anything that you would do specifically for the Korean community if you, as a governor? Oh, so the, I have a deep history uh, with the Korean community. So uh, I still go every year, uh, to many, many Korean events. Uh, I've had Korean American staff. Uh, just to, get, to give you a sense of a lot of the work, I tried to tailor a lot of my services. So when I was at the Board of Equalization, I fought to make sure that we kept publications in Korean because we know we have a lot, a lot of immigrant uh, owners of businesses who are trying to make it for their families and oftentimes government can be a, a huge hurdle. Uh, compliance can be incredibly difficult. So. I partner with the Korean Restaurant Association to do seminars to help Korean restaurant owners in Korean. I would do uh, seminars and partner with KYCC. We would do free income tax services for people who are Latino and Korean Americans. Uh, we did free income taxes uh, for a whole host. I did nonprofit seminars for Korean American community organizations so they understood uh, tax rules. 
I tried to bring leaders uh, from the federal government. So James Lee Witt, when you had the civil unrest, the riots here in Koreatown, when I was a staffer for Barbara Boxer, I brought you know, the FEMA director uh, to KAC to have meetings uh, to bring those gaps. And then the, on an annual basis, as I mentioned, I go to dozens of events in the Korean American community this year, including CARE, to the meeting with you know, your editor here yeah. uh, at Korean Resource, mm -hmm. uh, KRC. KRC, Korean Resource Center. I was just honored a couple months by KCCD, mm -hmm. so I have long-term friendships. But most importantly, what I try to do is I try to make sure that the Korean American community gets to be part of the leadership. Uh, I worked very hard to get David Rue elected. I, mm -hmm. I flew out and walked precincts for Kevin Kim, who's running for uh, a city council seat back in New York, right? So that oh, personal yeah. level and personal engagement to make sure that the Korean American communities are given the same opportunities that I was given. Everybody, regardless of faith, heritage, background, social economic status, deserves to live an opportunity to live in a state and a country that helps them reach their dreams. Okay, thank you for stopping by, John. Thanks, man.